Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Imagine waking up every single day convinced that the 24 hours ahead of you are a precious gift to be used wisely. Imagine also that you know exactly how to spend them to be a force for God's good. How do you learn to experience this abundant life fulfilling the plan God has for you? The answers are found in following the footsteps of the one who lived fully because he was determined that we might do the same. Our next guest follows the life and ministry of Jesus and the choices he made on his way to the cross. The study that she has written connects readers with the Savior on his mission to love the world and gives them a model for intentional living that they can replicate to live each day to the fullest and make a difference for God's kingdom. Imagine waking up every single day convinced that the 24 hours ahead of you are this precious gift. Imagine also that you can be a force for God's good. Heather Dixon is an author, speaker, and Bible teacher who understands living with a story that is not easy. And in her life, 24 hours are all that's given to her. She's been diagnosed with the vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, an incurable and terminal genetic disorder inherited from her mother. And she's dealt with difficult circumstances. She's passionate about encouraging and equipping women to trust in God, face their greatest fears, and live with hope. Through her blog, therescuedletters.com, speaking and Bible studies, Heather helps women find the courage to live by faith, even when they don't like their story. Here to discuss her new book, Determined, Living Like Jesus in Every Moment, is Heather Dixon. Heather, what an honor and privilege it is to have you on this program. Thank you, Eric. Thanks so much for having me on, and, and hi to everyone that's out there listening and watching. So thankful you're taking a few minutes out of your day to spend with us. I know it's a busy, busy day, and we appreciate you spending it with us today. Well, right now it is 8 p.m. prime time in the Middle East, where we are broadcast live every day, prime time. So you're talking to our audience in Pakistan, you're talking to our audience in Israel, in Iraq, and in India, and in Africa, and then this will be replayed all through all the days so that every time zone will have a chance to meet Heather Dixon all the way through 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. So it's very exciting that we're able to get this message out through web TV, which is a great advent of the internet that we have taken advantage of here on the Igniting a Nation Broadcasting Network. Heather. You were diagnosed uh, with uh, an incurable terminal genetic uh, chromosomal uh, level uh, illness, disease that uh, uh, puts you in risk of one day to the next of venturing every day into the unknown. Mm -hmm. How early on in your life was this diagnosed? So I was diagnosed very recently in 2016, um, but I noticed there were there was evidence of it even as early as I was 11 years old. But back then, you know, this was, you know, 1988, 1989, and it was on nobody's radar. Um, I, you know, was bruising very easily, uh, had a lot of ruptures in PE class. Uh, you know, I was that kid in PE class where I would have to sit out because, you know, I, I couldn't handle um, doing the volleyball spikes or uh, playing Nerf football and things like that. And, you know, back then we just thought, eh, well, she's just different. Um, and then over the years, I started to have these major medical events. Um, let's see, in 2010, my colon ruptured. Um, my son, when he was born in 2006, uh, he was born prematurely because my membranes ruptured early. Um, and so my doctors, you know, were, were aware that something was amiss, but vascular EDS is incredibly rare. Um, you know, many doctors don't know very much about it, and there are precious few that are doing any research for us. It just wasn't on anybody's radar. Um, and so then, let's see, the fall of 2015, I had, uh, a, let's see, I had a miscarriage. I had two uh, flare-ups with, with two different aneurysms, one of which would cause a partial kidney infarction. So I lost about 10% of my kidney function. And then not long after those events happened, my carotid artery ruptured. Um, and so, you know, they did the surgery and came out of the surgery. And this is just by God's grace, the doctor that was on call for my carotid artery rupture when, you know, I came in about 1.30 in the morning and the doctor was on call she was European. She was actually from Paris. And EDS is much well uh, 
I'm not necessarily sure if it's more prominent. It's just more well known in Europe. Right. Um, and she recognized it immediately. And so she said, you know, I think I think you're dealing with something else here because what she was also doing was putting the pieces together with my medical history with my mother's. My mother had passed away at the age of 37 when I was 11 um, from this rare medical uh, disease. She had a splenic artery aneurysm and then her, you know, her organs and her blood vessels just kept rupturing and they, they couldn't save her. I mean, they just couldn't hold her together. And, you know, back then we were told this is just really rare, but, you know, I, you know fast forward to 2016 for me right. and the doctors put all those pieces together and said you know what I think you have this genetic mutation we want to test you for this and of course they did and of course it came back positive so the diagnosis itself is still relatively new to me uh, I guess only three years in and I'm still learning as much as I can about it um, but it's something that obviously I was born with and, and it had all my life. So you lost your mother early mm -hmm. Take me back to Little Heather and to uh, the faith influences and, and, and were you a church family? When, when did faith become your own and if it was your own at the time of your mother's passing, how did that sustain you? How did that help you? Did that give you that dark night of the soul? What, you kind of give me a little bit of backstory on Heather growing up. Sure. So um, I did not know Jesus when my mother passed away, and I would not say that I grew up in a church home. Um, I, you know, my um, my mother was married to my stepfather, and we had stepbrothers and stepsisters, and it was just my family is all over the place. The only day that we would go to church every year was Easter Sunday, and my mother would take me. My stepfather would stay at home, and she would take my little brother and I, and uh, and we would go and you know go to Easter Sunday. Now, um, my grandmother, however, my mother's mother and my grandfather were faithful, faithful believers in God. And the one memory, I have a lot of memories with my grandparents because they just were so uh, uh, present in my life. Um, but my grandfather read from his Bible every single day. Like, mm. I, that's just a memory that just sticks with me. Um, you know, when I visited them every single night, the thing, I mean, it was, it was just this habit of faithfulness that he developed of opening up God's word every single day. And that's what he went to sleep to. And then when my mother died, my best friend from school, uh, I was in sixth grade at the time, and my best friend invited me. I was a very introverted, unchurched um, young woman who was just just utterly in grief because I just lost my mom and she recognized I was hurting and, you know, was being innocently, so just that pure faith of a child, just being so faithful in, uh, in, in spreading the love of Jesus with others. And she said, hey, do you, do you want to come to church camp with me? I, I had no idea what church camp was, um, you know, other than Easter Sunday and I, I visiting church with my grandparents. I had no experience with the church. And, uh, and of course, I, you know, I said, sure, okay, yes, having no idea what I was about to get into. Um, but Jesus was waiting for me there. And uh, through that week of just the, the fellowship and the sermons and, you know, the, the discipleship that happened among the leaders there, I met Jesus. Um, and I can remember the very last night when the, the preacher said, you know, does anyone want to make a decision for Christ? And of course, in my heart, I said, yes, yes, because I knew, you know, there, there was just this longing in my, in my heart that as an 11 year old, I couldn't fully articulate, but I recognized, I recognized that I was hurting um, and that Jesus could help. And I recognized also that, that I was a sinner and there was something that, that, that I needed that this world could not provide. Um, and so, you know, the pastor said, do you want to make a decision for Christ? And I said, yes. And I moved forward and, uh, you know, that asked Jesus to be my personal savior and committed the rest of my life to him. Now, I wish I could tell you that I had said yes at every stop along the way since then, but I haven't. Um, you know, my uh, father died when I was 31, and, you know, it was another wave of grief that hit me that I, I did not handle well. Um, and I got to tell you, I mean, I, I walked away from Jesus. I walked away from the church. I walked away from my faith in him because I just, I naively thought that, you know, when we when we become Christians, you know, when we um, commit ourselves to Jesus and ask him and, and give him authority over our lives, I thought, well, that's it. You know, everything else from here on out is rainbows and unicorns and picket fences. And you and I know that's not the way it is. And so when my uh, when my father died, I, um, 
you know, I, I just, I was done with death. And I told Jesus that. I said, Jesus, I'm done. I'm done with you. I'm done with death. I'm done with grief. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm out. And I, I walked away from him for a good four years of my life. But here, here is the thing about Jesus is that he is determined to love us. And he pursued me relentlessly until I was back into close and personal relationship with him. And uh, it was Easter Sunday, actually, when you know, my son we were reading through the passage and, you know, where uh, Jesus appeared to Mary in, in the garden and she doesn't see him because she's blinded by her faith and she thinks it's the gardener, you know, and she's just so distraught by grief. And it's where my heart had been for so, you know, for those years after my father died, um, you know, and she, she was just so blinded by her grief. She said, tell me, you know, where, where did you put, just tell me where he is, where did you put him? And then he calls her by name and she realizes, oh, it's Jesus. And he's been here all the time. And I remember my son, he shoved my Bible, the Bible, which my, my grandmother gave me this uh, the Christmas after my mother died. It's my first Bible. And it's the Bible that I read from every single day. It's a children's Bible. It's an NIV translation, but it's, it's technically a children's Bible, but it feels like home. Um, and so she, um, and my son was sitting in, in church with me and he shoved it in front of my face. He said, mommy, don't you see it's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. And I just, you know, was so flooded by the Holy Spirit with repentance and, uh, you know, just joy and, and comfort knowing that he had been there all this time. I just couldn't see him because of my grief. Um, so my, my faith journey has had, you know, lots of ups and downs. But I think that when you know um, a Savior who is determined to love you, when you know the links that he would go to to rescue you, you, you don't want any other way. And so I haven't looked back since that moment on Easter Sunday when my son said, it's Jesus. Um, and I, I, I don't want any other way. I want Jesus. When you got the diagnosis, <clears throat> you're now in this faith journey, your faith is shored up, your faith is firm, but you're dealing with medical crisis and you don't have answers and now you finally have an answer and it's not the answer you want. Mm -hmm. The answer you want is, is we found something wrong and we can fix it. That's the answer you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want the first part, but you're willing to accept the first part as long as you have the promise of the second part. But you got the same diagnosis Paul got, mm -hmm. right? Is that, uh, Lord, how long is this thorn going to be in my flesh? And it's going to be there. It's just going to be there. And definitely, until you see Jesus face to face, we're living with this, yeah. So how did you respond to it differently? What was it from what what place a sp place was it was it a place of 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 was it a dark night of the soul was it a place of confidence because you knew that it was Jesus all along and that whatever plan um, yeah yeah that's a great that's a great question thanks for asking that um no it was not i would i would uh label my time after my father died as my dark night of the soul um i would label my time after my diagnosis as uh grief uh by clinging to jesus um it was a dark season in my life i will not lie to you and tell you that that was you know it was beautiful at all. I mean, there were, uh, you know, we did, we looked at the doctors and we said, oh, uh, we got the diagnosis. And then my husband and I, you know, he took my hand and we said, they were like, great. What do we do? Um, you know, we live in an age where there's, you know, a medical cure for almost anything. So tell me what medicines do I take? Tell me what, uh, you know, what procedures do I pursue? What specialists do I need to see? And we were met with, you know, very kind and compassionate eyes um, who, you know, very carefully uh, phrase the following statement. Um, there is nothing. Um, this is incurable. Uh, this has a life expectancy of 48 years. Um, there is nothing we can do to prolong or to prevent what might happen to you. The only thing we can do is, you know, keep you close to a major medical hospital in the event that a major medical event happens and do damage control after it does. Um, and there are three, three major, um, 
three major um, events that are, are typical for someone with my condition, a ruptured colon, which I've, I've got, I've had, um, the ruptured carotid artery, which I've had, and then a ruptured aortic, uh, aortic root, which thankfully is not on my medical chart yet. Um, and so I've had two of the big three, and I think coming to grips with that, um, you know, was, uh, it, it was dark. I mean, it was dark. I'd say it was, a, a, the diagnosis came in January, and I say from about January to March, you know, really went through a period of deep depression, you know, of, um, of just clinging to Jesus during those days. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, I, before this, I had a career in the, in the fitness industry. Um, you know, I taught women how to live and, and be healthy in their bodies and to manage stress. And, um, you know, I mean, it was anxiety was, was something that was foreign to, I mean, we all deal with anxiety, but it, like the, a real onslaught of anxiety and panic attacks and just that mental stress and emotional stress was a bit foreign to me until my diagnosis. And I came really, really face to face with that, with the, the, the physical manifestation of my worry and emotional uh, stress over this diagnosis. And so there was, during that time, I set my phone, I set an alarm on my phone for every 60 seconds or every 60 minutes um, to pray because 60 minutes was about as long as I could go before I felt another wave of panic attack coming on. And that is, that's how uh, closely I clung to Jesus during those three months, because I, I just was completely, you know, like not in my own strength. It was not my own strength at all that got me through that. And, you know, Paul would say the same thing, you know, and, but here's, here's what Paul also says, you know, is that we, when we are weak, he is strong. And I think that, you know, one of the blessings of having this kind of diagnosis, and, and I'm going to say this really carefully for anyone who may be listening that has cancer or that has another chronic illness that just is not going away, uh, or certainly a, a diagnosis that is definitively terminal. Um, my diagnosis is a blessing to me. And it is by the grace of God that I can tell you and, and, and say those words. But what it does is it keeps me constantly relying on Jesus. And I wonder if when I get to heaven, Jesus is going to, to say, you know, well, we did this because we know your propensity for self-destruction. Because I, I had seen those days, you know, when I walked away from Jesus before. Heather, this is your second book and your first book, um, was uh, after your diagnosis. That's right. And one of the guidelines for your diagnosis is do not embark on any stressful events. <laughs> um, I'm a published author. Uh, I've written two bestsellers, and uh, they were probably two of the most stressful seasons in my life and trying to meet the deadlines and get things mm -hmm. back in time and... Uh, hash it out with editors and proofreaders and and uh, syntax and all kinds of things that I knew nothing about. Um, was it stressful for you? Uh, the first book or the second one? The first. Um, no, and here's why. I self-published the first one. Um, and I think that, you know, during that season, I, I was just putting one foot in front of the other in obedience. Um, you know, God really for another long story, but beautiful story of the way God um, uses his word to prepare us for the unknown ahead. He really used the, the book of Joshua to prepare me for that diagnosis. And it was a place that I had camped out in long before any of those major medical events happened in 2015. Um, and I, we, you know, one of the reasons we had remained so solid during that diagnosis was because God had already prepared us for it in his word. Um, and we really believe that, you know, Hebrews um, 4.12, that the word is living and active and it speaks directly into our situations regardless if it's you know now or a thousand years ago it still speaks clearly um and so you know i i had you know walked through joshua i spent months and months in joshua and then you know had a had a uh, just a small group of girls in my next door neighbor's house that did um bible study together and she said hey you think you know she knew i had this uh this brimming bible study had, you know all this material that you know just i said i I think someone needs to hear this. I think I know women that are walking through the unknown and need to know the promises that helped me because I like we came out of that okay and it was only because of Jesus and his word. And so I just started writing it and she said, "Would you, you know, would you write this for um 
for my, you know, the 10 girls that met literally my next, like right there, my next door right. my neighbor. And so I just started writing it. And I think, you know, that turned into, well, can you teach it at the church? And, and can you teach it in these other places as you travel and speak? And, and so uh, the benefit of doing a self-published study is that you are your own boss. And, um, you know, if, if I mess something up, it falls on me. Now, uh, the hard part of that is that you are your own boss and you are responsible for everything. So, uh, you know, I mean, all, all the, the, the design and the proofing and the editing and the uh, marketing, I mean, all of it fell on my shoulders. But because I was doing it myself, you know, it's like, well, if I mess this up, it's, it's just me. Um, so in a way, sure. I mean, I, I think when I get done, anytime I get done with a large writing project, I say, I'm never doing this again. I tell right. my husband that I'm never doing this again. Uh, but, you know, Jesus has a funny way of drawing us into places and uh, that we, you know, where we know that because, you know, he comforts us in these situations, we then by can comfort someone else. And, you know, I, I think it would be really unfaithful and disobedient for me not to share the things that I've learned because I know the goodness of God's word in my own life. Um, and so certainly, you know, there, there are pros and cons to both avenues of publishing. Um, but I think the Ready Study was, was definitely less I don't want to say less stressful. Uh, it was a different. It was a different kind of stress. Working with a traditional publisher with Abingdon Press this time for Determined was great because um, then I had I had help. You know, I mean, I had extra hands, uh, and that's that's a that's a blessing because really you can't you can't do this work on your own. Um, and so, you know, I had to write it, you know, which which was work. But then, you know, I could hand that off to other people, and that was, you know, it was it was a the stress for working with a traditional publisher came with deadlines and and also just the personal stress of knowing I am not the only only person. You know, there are other people who are responsible for this and who are affected by this. And you know, just personally, just my own personality that that brought a little bit of pressure. But um, but, I, you know, I'd say the stress is they're they're both stressful, uh, just different ways, different ways. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, there were a lot of things that I, I couldn't do anymore because of vascular EDS, uh, the physical, the physicality of my life, I could not do. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll never forget my, my grandmother, um, you know, who gave me my first Bible. She looked at me and she said, well, old girl, at least you can still write. You better get to it. And you know how God kind of sometimes closes everything to steer us into the door he needs us to walk through. And, um, you know, that is, I think that is exactly what happened with me and this diagnosis is that he used it, number one, to make me rely on him. And number two, uh, to steer me towards um, some tasks that, that he could use for his greater good and for his kingdom. And it's a privilege to do it. Well, when I opened up Determined, when it, when it came to me, what impressed me was this was not just another study in the book of Luke. Oh, thanks. There's a lot of Bible studies out there. There's a lot of six-week studies. There's a lot of things. Um, um, but this really impressed me as a detailed work. Why did you pick the Gospel of Luke and his perspective on... First of all, one, not having t the, the Matthew and John, of course, were with Jesus. Luke was a compiler of, of information from multiple sources in order to give the most comprehensive. Uh, being a doctor, that would be uh, something that was an attribute of his, was being meticulous mm -hmm. in his detail. Uh, what drew you specifically to the book of Luke? I think it was a number of things, some of which you just mentioned. You know, I mean, he he compiled a very thorough account of Jesus's life and ministry, and that's what I wanted. Um, that's one reason. And number two, I mean, he was a historian and a doctor, and his, you know, he's, he lays it out in the first chapter of Luke that that's his that's his mission is to is to create the most detailed account of Jesus's life, and I, and I think he does that well. Uh, you know, the third third reason is that he uh, he's a storyteller. I mean, even even as a historian and a doctor, I mean, his his gifts as divinely inspired by the human by the Holy Spirit um, are that he 
tell stories really well. And so to me, the book of Luke reads very much like a narrative um, in that, uh, you know, there's settings and character and transitions and tension. And uh, it, it's an easy story story to read. And it's not a story, but it is an easy story to read. Um, and so I, I really appreciated that about Luke. And then the final reason is, is a very specific one. Um, and it comes from a particular verse that he, that he uses. It's in, uh, that he writes in Luke 9, 51. And, you know, this happens at the end of Jesus's ministry in uh, Galilee. And he spent his early ministry bouncing around the shores of the Sea of Galilee and northern Galilee and Capernaum and all over and ministering up there. And then there's a turning point in his ministry where he has to turn south and make his way to Jerusalem because he's got an appointment to make with the cross. And here's how Luke writes that turning point transition for, um, you know, for Jesus in Luke 9:51. I'm going to read it to you from the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible version. It says, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. Now, obviously, the word determined there piqued my interest because, you know, this is the scope of the study. Um, but what 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 mattered to me more was the phrasing in the beginning of that verse that Luke wrote. He said, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up. Now, Luke could have said when it came time for him to die on the cross or when it came time for him to meet his appointment on the cross or to, you know, be crucified. But he didn't say that. He said when the time, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up. And to me, it just was such a reminder that there is a bigger story always happening in our lives. And that bigger story is good. And there is glory awaiting us. And if we can just keep our minds, our, our determined mindset on the perspective that, yes, we may be carrying our cross on this earth. We may be carrying hard things. We may be walking through difficult medical diagnoses, but there's a bigger story and there's a bigger thing coming up ahead. And that's the perspective that we have to keep in mind. And so, you know, I just really appreciated Luke's, uh, the way he phrased that particular moment, um, because I think it spoke to, uh, to our, our goal for the determined study is, you know, we, we need to be determined recognizing that there's greater glory for us coming, um, and that we can, we can live through this, this hardship, this trial, this thorn in our flesh, because we know what's coming. And that's, you know, it's that mindset that will help us live determined. So those are just a few of the ways that I, uh, a few of the reasons why I chose Luke's gospel over the other three. You know, there's several things that, that, that jump out in my spirit about uh, the Gospel of Luke. One was mm -hmm. the message of counting the cost. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. and I had to literally count the cost that I would lose 14 million relatives mm -hmm. the moment that I professed my faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. The average person doesn't have to count that cost. They really don't have to count the cost of rejection That's or persecution right. at all. Uh, so that was one. The second was that Luke uh, 10, 18, and 10, 19 mm -hmm. are two of the most powerful scriptures for you and for myself, for anyone who faces uh, wondering where Jesus was, what he was doing, when he was where, and that's, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and I give you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy, that nothing whatsoever shall harm you. Mm -hmm. And here you've been diagnosed with a disease that will harm you. Uh, it will bring an end to your life earlier than the normal life, and your family has had to adjust to the fact that this is a possibility that is not just a possibility, it's a reality. Uh, praying that between now and 48 that there will be some breakthrough development, uh, that they will decide that um, at a certain age they might want to do some reinforcement of your aorta uh, proactively uh, so that it can't rupture. You know, there may be things that they decide to do and I would pray that all those answers would come your way or you would find out that uh, my people in Israel have already prepared something brand new that's just not being done here, 
and you'll get to go there right. and have have it accomplished. But uh, there's a certain you are right determination. There's nothing vague in Luke's account. Everything is determined right. and with a very specific determination uh, as you would want a doctor to give you a very specific explanation of your diagnosis. So when you finally met the doctor who was able to diagnose what you had, you found a certain, a certain amount of comfort in the fact that at least you were in the known mm -hmm. as opposed to the unknown. That was some of my takeaway from uh, this study that you did, uh, was this determination to embrace the known, the unknown to make it known. Right. That was really kind of the journey. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny you mentioned um, that particular passage, you know, because that has so many echoes of Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 is a verse that I pray almost every single day over me and my family and over my son. Um, there is a 50% chance that he also has inherited this disorder. We don't think he has. We have not confirmed that yet. Um, there are, um, you know, it's a blood test he has to take. He doesn't have any of the manifestations of it that I did at his age. But, um, but you know, Psalm 91, is is a verse that I cry out often. You know, Lord, uh, command your angels to protect them in, in, in you know, all their ways. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that now moving from the unknown to the known, one of the things it forces you to do is it forces you to come to terms with what you expect out of life. Um, you know, and I think that most Americans um, and I mean humanity in general, but definitely Americans who have very little exposure to real hardship um, and persecution. Um, you know, I think that we have a very gross amount of expectations on our on our lives. Um, you know, the expectation for long lives, the expectation for safety, the expectation for, you know, this number of children and this kind of house with this picket fence and these two cars. And, you know, I mean, it, it's just we it, we live in a culture that breeds unreal expectations. And sure, the majority of us may live our lives and be just fine. Um, but I think that, you know, having this type of diagnosis and walking through that with Jesus really, really, um, force me to count the cost, like you said. And and here 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 is the outcome of that is that you can't <coughs> harm me. You you cannot harm me. Uh, you know, we we live in a broken world. We live and, you know, because of the fall of man and the effect of sin on this world, we live with these consequences of, you know, diseases and uh, medical illnesses and murder. And, you know, I mean, all, all these horrible things that we, um, you know, we are facing. Uh, but still, you can't harm me because the moment that Jesus decides to take me from this earth, I will be face to face with him. And there's nothing better with that. You know, I've, I've been meditating so much on, on Paul's, you know, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Um, and I don't think that there is a more profound verse in the Bible to me. Now, I love the Bible. And so that's, that's saying a lot. But for right now, for the season, the things I'm meditating on with Jesus right now, that that's it. I mean, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And there is nothing else. Um, so, you know, I think the human side of me and, and for my family, you know, we have to do the hard work of preparing for the moment that I will leave this earth. You know, my son is, we have to have conversations. He's, he's uh, 12 right now and um, he's my only son. So we have to have conversations with him about what that means. And, you know, we believe that transparency and honesty as much as he can handle is, is the best decision. Um, and and so he knows he knows what we're walking through and he knows that I might not be there when he gets married. I might not be there when he graduates college. Maybe I will. You know, only only, you know, God knows the number of our days. Um, and, you know, we just we have to really come to grips with those hard things so that we can clear them out of our mind and then go live like to live is Christ. And um, I, I'll share with you you know, another passage that, that the Lord really spoke life over me um, in that, you know, we were talking earlier about that dark season, you know, the, of, of I write it for my diagnosis. And I was really asking God this question of, okay, is this it? 
you know, you you promise me, you know, that I will see goodness in the land of the living, Lord. Um, have have I reached my max capacity for that, or is it just heaven? Like, is that is that what I'm after? Um, or you know, is is there still work for me to do here? Um, and one of the passages that he drew me to, you know, as I was processing the ramifications of all that, was Deuteronomy 30. And you know, when he 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 he, sell, he tells his people, you know, I, I have set before you blessings and death, blessings and curses, life and death. Now choose life. And for me, that just, it was so powerful because I, you know, it was um, such an encouragement to put two feet on the floor. I mean, I spent a lot of time in bed and in the recliner because of you know, physical limitations for my surgeries, but also because of just the depression that I was moving through. And, you know, after walking through that passage and hearing those words, you know, God's word just leapt off the pages at me, choose life, get your two feet on the floor, get out of bed and do some work for God's kingdom. Because if you have a pulse, you have a purpose and you're not done here. And when you are, then you'll see Jesus face to face. And but there's, there's nothing to fear between now and then. You know, you, from the moment that I um, accepted Jesus as my personal savior, from that moment, moment forward, you cannot harm me. Before that moment, yes, there was harm threatened um, because I would have ended up in hell. But, you know, from that moment forward, I am protected. I am, you know, under God's divine protection. Even though we may have trouble in this world, you know, you, there's nothing you can do to harm me. And so, you know, those are just hard questions that no one wants to face. But that's, you know, that's the reality of humanity. You, you used a particular method uh, and I like the method because it challenges you to set the book aside grab a hold of the scripture and go back to the book and make sure that you've engaged you don't give uh, there's there are the self-contained my books are self-contained mm -hmm. uh, you just sit down and do them uh, this this requires you to kind of go outside and connect some dots and do some real searching within. Um, is this how you have done Bible studies before? Is this uh, something that you've crafted for yourself or something you've patterned after something that really ministered to you? Uh, there's there's kind of a, an imprint, a, 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 a Heather Dixon signature <laughs> on this that's a little different than I've seen elsewhere. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've, I've done Bible studies for a long time. Um, I mean, I, I'm a, a, a Bible study devotee. Um, I think that um, it's, a, it's a, obviously a beautiful practice to keep. But I think over time, um, I got frustrated with that mentality of, okay, you do the study and you close the book and put it on the shelf and then you do another study. Um, and, you know, that cycle, you know, although it teaches you a lot about God and, and you can relate to him, there's an intimate fellowship that happens during that. And that there's that's a beautiful thing. Uh, that should always be our first step. Um, but I think that it misses the point of taking it live and taking it into action. You know, faith without works is dead. And so we can study the Bible all we want um, and I love studying the Bible, uh, but unless we actually put that into practice and, and, and live out what it's telling us to do, uh, then we're missing an opportunity to bring hope into a broken world for Jesus. And so, you know, um, I think that, yes, I had seen snippets of this, you know, action item, you know, let's make this tangible kind of thing in some Bible studies, but I wanted it, number one, I, I wanted it to be upfront, and I also wanted it to be easy for my readers to remember. And so, you know, that's why you see that, that, tool, that template, you know, showing up, worship, word, pray, obey. And, you know, it may sound like, you know, the Southern Baptist in me says it may sound like a very, that's a very, um, um, uh, Sunday school answer, you know, okay, worship, word, pray, obey, got it. But really it's not. I mean, when we combine the, that action um, into every single day, I mean, that sets us, up, sets us up for living like Jesus. And it's that obedience part of it that we've got to follow through with. And so, you know, I mean, I wanted in every 24-hour tw period 
for those four things to be present for me personally. Um, you know, I wanted to spend time in worship and I wanted to spend time reading his word and I wanted to spend time dedicated to prayer. And oftentimes those three activities are woven together. You know, sometimes there's, there's not a finite uh, uh, separation between the three of them. And sometimes there is, um, but I wanted those three things, the worship and being in the word and praying to then enforce and influence how I obeyed. Otherwise, how would we know to obey? You know, how, how do we know unless we're doing all of those things, um, you know, how, what God actually needs us to do. Um, and I think that, you know, one of uh, Jesus's, one of the things, you know, that, that we learn while we were looking at Luke and seeing how he, how he did ministry was that Jesus knew the difference between good and best. And, you know, we think that that passage at the end of Luke five, I think it is where, uh, you know, he's he's the crowd is clamoring, you know, help, you know, save me, help me, heal me. Would it have been good for him to stay and help those people and save and heal? Sure. It would have been a beautiful thing. But but was it his best for God's will over his life? No. And he knew that. And he said, you know what? I must continue to preach the good news because this is why I have come. And so, uh, you know, to me, I, I just, I want and crave that type of wisdom and direction. Um, and that's why that practical tool, um, you know, resonates so much in the determined study, because I think that it's an, it's easy to remember. I mean, my, my human mind is, is very, uh, little <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, there's only so much in there that I can remember on a daily basis. So that, that template worship word, pray, obey, um, you know, makes it easy to remember and then e also easy to live out and live determined and every day. Heather, you include a diagram of the temple. Yeah, I am just so incredibly excited to see that because the temple was the center of Jewish life. It was the center of the calendar. It was the center of you, you had three required pilgrimages during the year in which you must, uh, these were required. In Hebrew, it's shalosh regalim. It was required pilgrimages, and they take up uh, a great deal of time. Uh, there is the travel to, there is the event, and there's the travel back from, and so there are several months of a person's life who, if they don't live in Jerusalem, if they live in the diaspora and the dispersed areas, they had to make. And so you start out with uh, the first visit to the, to the temple, followed by the second visit to the temple, which are very important uh, from a covenantal perspective mm. in order to maintain the identity of the Messiah being Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the dedication, the circumcision, the entrance, all of these things are incredibly important because of the establishment of his Jewish identity. Uh, not everyone is drawn to even understand, <clears throat> to relate to the fact that this was the Jewish Messiah and that it was the Jews who believed in Jesus. Virtually for the first 200 years, it was a very Jewish thing to do, and it was unusual for the Gentile to come into the kingdom. This was something that was new. Uh, it was at least for the first hundred years, first century Judaism and first century believers were Jewish. So the context of all this in the fulfillment, the Matthew 5.17 fulfillment, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets, I came to fulfill them, begins with the beginning, which starts in the covenant relationship in Genesis mm -hmm. with the Abrahamic covenant, with the covenant of circumcision that begins to establish this lineage of the seed line of the seed of the woman being fulfilled in the person of Messiah. It's missed by most, mm. but you captured it right at the very beginning. Well, I think that, uh, gosh, there's, there's so much in, in what you just said, but I, you know, I think that, um, I think it is important, number one, 
for readers, particularly um, um, American readers, you know, who may be picking this up, who have no awareness of that. And, you know, one of the things that I, I really try to do as an author and when I'm teaching the Bible, whether it's through a book or in person, is to take someone into um, that setting so that they can see. I mean, for, for me, I'm such a visual learner. And, um, you know, I wanted them to really understand, okay, you know, th this is the Gentiles courtyard. This is the court of women where Anna, you know, recognized her savior as she saw the baby Jesus right there. And she was determined to worship, you know, all of her days. I wanted her to see the complexities and the beauty of the temple. Um, and I wanted readers to understand, you know, visually what was happening there in those first few days of, of the first few chapters of Luke in those first, you know, few weeks of Jesus's early life. And then again, I wanted them to recognize the full circle of where this is ending, beginning and ending in the same place. And, you know, this, the, the mystery of God's providence over, over that and over the history and the prophecies that have been fulfilled from Genesis 3.15, you know, that were all culminating here in this place. And, you know, one of the things that I, I wrote as I was uh, doing all my research was that I re what I really want to do, and, and I'll do this in my own time. I don't know if it'll ever turn into something uh, that's, that's public, but I, wanted, I want to trace and study the lineage of the temple, um, you know, from the tent to where Jesus was crucified to our hearts now that are Jesus' dwelling place. And, you know, how that um, has evolved and changed through the history of the world and through, you know, how the Bible writes that. Because I, I don't know, to me, I was really, really fat. I'm so glad you, you brought uh, just the temple up because I just am so fascinated um, uh, this, by uh, that. This, this was the first time... <clears throat> Uh, in the building of Solomon's temple, right. uh, in the dedication, the dedication was the first time that anybody had ever prayed for the Gentiles. Mm. And King Solomon, in dedicating the temple, said to the Lord, he said, if the stranger around the world will face this place and offer their prayer, I beseech you to incline your ear to hear their prayer from the stranger that knows that this is the place that bears your name mm -hmm. and to answer them and to grant them their wish. The first time there was this intercession through the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the temple on behalf of the Gentiles. So it plays a very important part in this picture of the reconciliation of Jew and Gentile, of the one new man of this creation, of why it was that this vision that Paul was given, uh, Peter was given of Cornelius, and how he was to go to him, and how Jesus died for all that, that one gave his, his life. Uh, the bottom line message that you're living, but you also want to share. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not because of your, you are not defining yourself by your condition, mm -mm. Uh, but you are determined. Your determination comes from accomplishing all that God has you to accomplish in this season so that no moment is wasted that's something that's very apparent and is available to every person and they don't have to have a diagnosis in order to go through this. That's right. And here, here's the thing that I think, uh, you know, what God is teaching me about this diagnosis and, and one of the reasons why, like you said, I'm not labeling myself with this, sure. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's a part of who I am, but it's not my label. But here is what it is. Um, it is a manifestation of the gospel itself. Um, you know, it is um, the, the reality that there is no cure for me on this earth except for Jesus. The only way that I will receive true healing, full and complete healing, is by being face to face with Jesus. You know, he is the ultimate healer. And sure, I mean, are there moments where he has done physical healing here on earth where it happens before heaven? Absolutely. But, you know, and, and I mean, I'm not saying that couldn't happen for me, but if it doesn't, then, you know, the, the only cure for me is Jesus. And that is the gospel. You know, you, you, you may not be walking around with an incurable disorder. You may not be walking around with some crazy, you know, 
pronounced medical term, medical uh, disorder, but we are all walking around with this infestation of sin, which is terminal. And uh, our only cure for that is Jesus. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think that that is, um, again, that's one of the ways that I see this as a blessing. It's a hard blessing. Sure. No one wants to have this crazy diagnosis, um, but it is a blessing because it's constantly reminding me of the gift of the good news of the gospel. Uh, you know, that, that Jesus is our cure and he is our hope. Uh, he can redeem anything and restore anything in our lives. Um, and I, I wake up with that reality every single day. And it's, it, to me, it's good news. It's good news. Well, you are determined, and you are Heather Dixon, author of the book Determined, Living, Life, Living Like Jesus in Every Moment, a study. And I would say it's a comprehensive study in the book of Luke. Heather Thank Dixon, you. what a pleasure it is to have met you, and may the Lord bless all the works of your hands. And you as well, Eric. Thanks so much for your time. God bless you. We're going to take a short Thank break, you. and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 